Well, another EU leadership meeting is also underway. The heads of state are discussing the bloc's long-term budget and pandemic recovery plan. It was dealt a severe blow earlier this week when Hungary and Poland vetoed it. Their bloc was in protest against the rule of law being tied to the distribution of funds. Slovenia has also rejected the EU's stance on the matter. Romania reminded all three nations that their position is having a negative impact on all EU citizens. The European Parliament is refusing to back down on the condition. Well, let's cross straight over to Brussels where we can speak to our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Good evening to you, Darren. As things stand, the talks are deadlocked. But what tools and methods can the leaders use in order to persuade Poland and Hungary to finally sign off on this budget. Yeah, that's the really critical issue, isn't it, uh, Oliver? As you say, EU leaders meeting again, facing yet again another crisis. And one that's pretty big. We're talking about, you know, a seven-year EU budget that's due to go on uh, for years and years. Many uh, people relying on that uh, budget. And on top of that, of course, the coronavirus recovery fund worth up to 750 billion euros. Much needed, many would say, uh, given that economies across the continent have been ravaged uh, by lockdowns and indeed by uh, the virus. And so the EU are trying to work on this solution to try to get Hungary and Poland uh, and indeed Slovenia back on board. Now, what is interesting is that many of those leaders and indeed MEPs are entirely unwilling to back down on this issue of the mechanism of the rule of law. There have been suggestions from the Commission as a part of a compromise uh, that the terms of how the mechanism would be used would be objective. This mechanism in part, of course, would potentially stop the transfer of funds uh, from Brussels Brussels to certain EU countries if they were found to be in breach of rule of law issues such as judicial independence and media polarity. But there are others suggesting that they need to take this further, Oliver, potentially that the EU countries may well need to find mechanisms outside of the EU altogether to redistribute this money, excluding Poland and Hungary, trying to hit those countries where it hurts hardest in their pocket. Uh, that would be a pretty bold and a pretty unprecedented move for them to do so. But it is a sign, I think, of just how important many review this budget and indeed the coronavirus recovery uh, fund. Uh, but there must be said also, I think there is certain pressure on leaders such as Viktor Orban to give ground in the sense that they know that this is reputationally not doing them or indeed their countries any good with people in places like Italy and Spain pretty desperate to see this process unblocked. Now, I've had a chance to speak to one Hungarian MEP. He represents the Fidesz party of Viktor Orban. And I started by asking him essentially what were the fundamental problems he's seen with the agreement as it currently stands. The most important problem uh, for Hungary as well as for Poland with this um, so-called rule of law mechanism and tying that into uh, the use of EU funds has been that... Uh, the Brussels elite, uh, and especially the, the ideological left, has been misusing uh, the concept of the rule of law. It has not been an objective set of criteria that uh, what, what, it, what it should be. Uh, rather, it has been misused and abused and turned into an ideological weapon um, and, and, and a means of blackmailing, actually. Those countries and, 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 um, and governments that dare say no to the Brussels directives about migration uh, and about the ideological line to follow. Now, that's not the kind of European Union Hungary joined back in uh, 2004. We joined a union of free nation states, member states, that cooperate based on mutual trust and cooperation. And that's what we think should be the way forward. Uh, let's work on the basis that you may well be right in that. Uh, and lots of people will, will disagree and say it's an objective mechanism. But let's say it is this battle that you talk about. You're in the minority. Uh, the majority of countries support the mechanism. You're a Democrat. Your government has been elected three times in Hungary. Why not just accept, like the opposition parties in Hungary have had to accept, the will of the majority? Well, in this uh, particular sense, it's very, very important that the European Union and its institutions and member states stick to the treaty which is in force. Uh, what is happening right now, uh, trying to uh, sort of um, uh, smuggle in a new concept uh, through the back door, 
um, about uh, an undefined uh, criteria, which is the rule of law. Where I mean, it's, it's, no, it's, not, it's not really being it's not really been smuggled it's in. It's been, it's been agreed by the European Parliament and indeed by the vast majority of EU members. It, it's not been smuggled in. Uh, a, a relative majority, but not unanimously. Now, the treaty states very clearly that about the multi-annual financial framework, and in this particular case, the next generation EU, which is a large recovery fund, and it's in the common European interest, there must be unanimous agreement. Now, there is no agreement uh, about anything until everything uh, is agreed upon, every detail. And this detail is a very important detail. Hungary has had a very negative experience over the past two years about how the rule of law has been abused and misused against us. Uh, we have had a bad experience in the European Parliament. We've had a bad experience in the negotiations uh, that were labeled as, as, as ones about the rule of law, but really they were ideological attacks because we said no to illegal migration. The consequence of this is that the recovery fund and indeed the budget uh, is being put on hold. It may go back to, uh, to default funding levels. And that's, you know, that's not good news for Hungary. That means less money for you guys. In fact, actually, many here in Western Europe uh, would be quite supportive of that. It means less subsidy for uh, the Hungarian administration. Listen, it's a question of principle. It's not a question of money, primarily. Uh, the principle of the European Union must be mutual respect and an equality between member states. Unanimity, uh, as it's written in the treaties in certain particular uh, cases, is there for a reason. Uh, it's because when we make decisions of such magnitude, of, of such importance, we need everybody on board. Now, you cannot do that with an exclusive type of ideologically motivated approach. That's wrong. Would you at least the, the recognize would you at least then would you at least then recognize that this is doing Victor Orban an awful lot of reputational damage. If you were an Italian today or a Spanish person who's desperate for this coronavirus recovery fund money, you'd be thinking why is Victor Orban holding up our economic recovery, potentially destroying our livelihoods in the years to come? Hungary has been a strong supporter of helping the countries in need of especially the southern um, uh, countries in the European Union. They are the ones who are in most need of quick uh, financial assistance. The Hungarian economy is in better shape. But we are solidarity. We show solidarity towards them. And so out of you, that, you, we are fully supportive. You, you, we're fully you, supportive of the we're fully supportive of the recovery fund and the MFF based on objective and, and mutually acceptable rules. The responsibility for this uh, trouble right now lies with those who break the treaty that governs the European Union and want to uh, enforce an ideologically biased approach onto everybody. That's contrary to the founding principles of the European Union. I think that interview, Darren, just shows how tough the negotiations are going to be at that meeting. Another round of really tough negotiations was taking place in Brussels today, now suspended, as we were mentioning earlier on in the programme. That is the post-Brexit trade talks, all because of COVID-19 infections. How does this suspension hamper or affect the very little time left there is to strike a deal? Well, it's clearly not welcome. You're right in saying that Michel Barnier and David Frost, who's the UK's lead negotiator, sent out tweets uh, essentially at the same time this afternoon stating that talks would be suspended since one of Michel Barnier's team had tested po positive for coronavirus. David Frost saying uh, that the health of their teams was their number one priority. But clearly, uh, this is yet another stumbling block to trying to reach a deal. There had been pretty intense nego negotiations over the last uh, couple of weeks uh, to try and get over those remaining obstacles to a Brexit trade deal when it comes to fisheries, when it comes uh, to governance and to level playing field issues. But there was a real sense, I think, in the last few days that, you know, a deal was, was pretty close, that it may well be signed off at the end of this week or indeed the start of uh, next week. The, clearly, there is signs that negotiations are going in the right uh, way. They would need to be, as you say, given how little time there is left. What we don't quite know is how long this suspension is going to last for and what impact it will have in terms of the time frame. But ultimately, the mood music here, Oliver, is quite optimistic that a deal is just around the corner. Uh, of course, time will then uh, have to play out whether it can be properly signed off and ratified before the end of the year and before its implementation is due to kick in on the 1st of January next year. Darren McCaffrey joining us there from Brussels. Thank you very much.